Hello and welcome to episode number 18 of the Expert Table Tennis Podcast. My name is Ben Larkham and joining me on today's show is Chris Main, who is a professional table tennis coach and player uh, living up in Scotland. Now Chris is from a town called Saltcoats, which is I think about half an hour or 40 minutes away from Glasgow. It's by the coast and what Chris's vision is for this place is to really build up his table tennis club North Ayrshire and to turn Saltcoats into a real hub of table tennis. He's doing loads of coaching in the local schools. He's looking to really build up the sport both in participation and also in the high level stuff. And you hear about that in the show. He actually just recently brought the ETTU Cup to, to Saltcoats. So he's bringing international table tennis to his town as well as doing all the work in the schools. And he's really trying to turn table tennis into more of a community event with a local club that people can come and support. And I think this is exactly what, what we need in British table tennis at the moment is more of this work to build up strong local clubs that are going to be able to develop players and also attract a lot more interest to the sport locally and nationally. I hope you enjoyed the show with Chris Main from North Ayrshire Table Tennis Club. Let's get straight into it. Joining me on the show today is Chris Main. Hi, Chris. Hi, yeah. How's it going? Yeah, doing really well. Thank you. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Right now, I've known you for a while because you're you're pretty active playing tournaments and coaching in in the UK. But for those of us that are that are outside of of Britain that are listening to the show, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got started in table tennis, and and kind of the level that you're playing now? Yeah, so I'm Scottish number four senior. Uh, I've played for Scotland numerous times at junior and senior level. Uh, I used to have played British Premier League. We won the National League four times in Scotland in a row. Uh, I started table tennis when I was 13 years old by going on holiday to Centre Parks and we ended up playing a table tennis tournament where two Scottish internationalists were playing as well. So we kind of got inspired off seeing how fast and how good these guys were. Was that just a coincidence then that they were there? Yeah, it just was a coincidence. It was uh, David Atkins and Peter Atkins, two players who are still pretty active playing in Edinburgh leagues and stuff like that, but they were the two people who we seen uh, playing and then they told us to join, try and find a local club back home. So for the next two months, we played table tennis pretty much every day. Me and my brother, Richard Men, uh, who's still similar standard to me just now. Uh, and we joined a local club, which was just like, a senior club with maybe 10 or 12 over 50 players playing away and then we just turned up and proved that week in, week out and then a few of my friends started going and then because the club was getting too busy and too many people were sitting off, the seniors didn't really like it and then my dad took the initiative really and started decided that, OK, I'm going to start our own club up and then that's, that's where we are just now. Right, so, so you hadn't really played at all until you were 13. Yeah, so I, I was a definitely a late starter. Like I, I've, I, I was playing catch-up from the word go, really. Uh, but my first national championships, I got knocked out in the group stages, never won a match, and that was at 14 years old. So I think it's very advantageous for me to have a brother who was always a similar level, level to me, which meant that any time I wanted to train, we could train close by or in the garage where we had a table tennis table and I still th- I still put that down to why we did get and we have playing it at national and international level to have each other to spur us on and train with it's, it's, it's been important yeah yeah so that's kind of your advantage over over the typical player is having someone constantly there that also wants to play loads just like you for sure and I think even not just a brother, but as a team, like you learn from each other's mistakes as well as spun people on. For example, if Richard was 2-0 up, 10-6 up, and four match points up, and he lost in a competition, that would be in the back of my head as well, saying, right, when I go on next, I need to make sure if I am 2-0, 10-6 up, that I have to finish that match off because it's possible for them to come back because I've witnessed that firsthand, if that, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So what what I'm interested in thinking about is, so you say you started at 13, you went to your national championships at, at 14. Yep. Um, now, I assume you, you said you didn't win a match. Like You would have been up against players that have been playing for years and years, wouldn't you? Well, I was 13 
like playing in the under 15s then and I had Craig Howison in my group who was two or three years younger than me and he beat me 3 now. So that was a wee wake up call for me thinking, okay, I've just lost to someone 3 now here. But after that, as I was saying previously, like Terry McLernan from Drum Chapel, he came down to the wee scout hut that our senior club was based in and said, okay, boys, you and Richard are quite good. Would you like to come to Drum Chapel? And we, for the next three or four years, we went to Drum Chapel three or four nights a week to train and at Drum Chapel back then and as as still now, one of the best clubs about with top Scottish players and good coaches. So I think it was just training at a good level and a good environment which and make that make us improve so fast. For example, Richard and I, we would go to a tournament and play all day Saturday, all day Sunday, travel back on Sunday night and then go out to the garage for four hours on a Sunday night after playing 12 hours for two days and just play, play, play. That's the only thing that we've done for three or four years. So uh, that's I think that's why we improved a lot faster than other players. Just playing like a huge amount of table tennis. Yep, yep. Yeah, had you had you played other sports before table tennis when you were younger? Yeah, uh, like Richard was really good at football, like really good. Like he, he was signed with a couple of like your, your Scottish teams, uh, and as soon as table tennis kicked in, he had to make that decision. Like, does he want to play table tennis? Does he want to play football? He picked table tennis, and then I was. I, I've always been good at racket sports, badminton, tennis, squash. So I think always I always talk about this just to my friends and stuff like that, transferable skills in sports are just the same as any other walk of life. Like if you are good at badminton, tennis, and you've got a, an odd goal, for example, and you try and move to another sport, you should pick it up faster than someone who doesn't have a good background of sport and knowledge, purely because it's the same rough idea in every sport. Like for example, table tennis, you've got your stance. Like your stance is one of the most important parts. If you're a golfer, you just stand near enough the same as table tennis. If you play badminton, you stand. So all of these things kind of paint the same picture. And I think that's what that's another reason why I'm maybe improved so fast, because I did have a good knowledge of how to play sports before I started table tennis. Yeah, you had like a good foundation for a lot of the... A lot of the kind of fundamental skills that that then you build upon. Definitely, yeah. Like I, I, as a coach now, like I, I've co- I coach at North Ayrshire when I'm a development officer, and I coach at Dumfries when I'm a development officer. I always try and make it relative. So, to like for example, I would always ask, ask a kid, "What sport do you play?" And he would say, "Oh, I'm, I'm play. I play golf. I'm quite good at golf. I'm a member at a golf club." So I would say, "Listen, you're trying to hit." that shot too hard like you're trying to hit that shot 200 yards down the fairway but what you want to do is just you're 90 yards away from the green you just want to pitch it up you, that's the kind of table tennis shot that you want to play with if that makes sense try and make a comparison to what they know in another sport and hopefully they can see and listen and improve a little bit better in table tennis if I can compare it to a sport they know yeah you're just linking things together yep, just, so you said you said that um that kind of you'd always been good at racket sports and that, that perhaps helped your table tennis. Do you think that that the practice that you'd done in other racket sports meant that you were good at racket sports and therefore that helped your table tennis? Or do you think you were just naturally always suited to racket sports, hand-eye coordination, those kind of things, even before you'd started playing them? Yeah, I think like I'm a true believer that this word talent is just non-existent. Really. I think everybody's... I think, for example, people with good hand and eye coordination, that's just built up from playing sports in the first place. I've always, my mum's very sporty, my dad's very sporty. We've always played sports, even since we've been two or three years old. We're always playing football or we went to centre parts twice a year for 25 years, 20 years. So I was introduced to near enough every sport that was on offer. And I think that's why my hand-eye coordination is good. Why I'm good at badminton and tennis and table tennis and squash, all of these things. You look at, for example, your number one and number two in Scotland who are top professional players, Gavin Rungay and Craig Howison. These, Gavin and Craig both come from a sporting family where Gavin's mum and dad both played badminton for Scotland and Craig was playing golf. 
he's a single handicap golfer. He's uh, he used to play badminton uh, in the junior Scotland squad. So these guys have got what I'm just talking about, transferable skills as well, where they've learned something from one sport and then transferred that over to the other. It's not even like hand-eye coordination. A lot of people don't know what it takes to be good. I think I always say that to the juniors at the club as well. Like Being good at something is very, very hard. It takes a lot of effort and time and commitment where... A lot of people just aren't willing to do it. Like I always say, like you always, I, I would always take a two-star player with a five-star work rate over a five-star player with a two-star work rate. You would, okay. You would always take a hard-working person with maybe not the natural flair and natural, so-called natural ability. You would always, I, I would always take a five, a, a two-star player with a five-star work rate because he's going to listen. He's going to turn up on time for every session. And then because he does that over a long period of time, he's going to improve faster than the five-star player with the two-star work rate. Yeah, so so you're thinking long-term instead of short-term. Yeah. You said that at at present you're number four in Scotland, is that right? How What what kind of level did you get to in the juniors starting so late? Did you get pretty high in that as well? Yeah, I was always top four, I think. As I said previously, the first national competition I went to I, I, I never won a match in under 15 level, which was my age group. And then the next year, I, I won. I went to the semi-finals. So that was a huge jump for me to go from not winning a, a match in the national championship to the semi-finals. So ever since then, I was always maybe top four or five in the junior or under 15 rankings. But I, I don't know if that's a true reflection of the standard I was at. Like, Scotland wasn't as strong back then in what it is now. Scotland's got a very, very good junior team just now with Chris Wheeler and Yazer and Callum Morrison and stuff like that. They're definitely a little bit stronger than what the junior team was back when I was coming through. Okay. Yeah, so I definitely do think as a player, I've improved a lot from junior level to senior level, which maybe that I don't think that happens very much in the UK or in Scotland. I was I was talking to someone at the South of Scotland Open just last week and he was saying that he doesn't remember a Scottish player improved so much from junior to senior level as much as me. And which I thought was quite an interesting comment. Uh, but yeah, yeah you, I don't know Ben if you can agree here, but you don't see many players improve drastically from 18 to 25. No, most of the most of the top seniors are generally have been very top juniors, yeah. top cadets. It's, they've just followed it all the way through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that yeah, there there are a handful. Yourself, um, I think I think Adam Nutland came through relatively yep. late. D- David McBeth, he was always a good junior, but I feel like he's made a big jump to being a very very good senior international player uh, from junior to senior. But I, I, Adam Nutland, yeah, that's another good example. Yeah, like, why do you think that is? Do you think that there is something about age and learning when you're young, or do you think it's just that generally once people get to 18, they, they're struggling to find the time to actually get the, the same type of practice in as they would if they were kind of 13 or 14? Yeah, I think a lot of change happens in anyone's life at 18. You go to uni, or you get a job, you get a car, uh, you're allowed to go out and party and stuff like that, which is a lot more distractions than if you were 15 or 16. But, yeah, I think that there's just gets, there's too many things gets in the way and table tennis isn't your first priority anymore. And I think with me, when I was 18 to, say, see, when I was 18, I got a full-time job and quit for two years. And then when I came back, when I was about 20, I realised how much I missed it. And ever since, when I came back to it, I've just been table tennis, table tennis, table tennis, and that's been my number one priority. And I think that two years out of table tennis is very good for me because it shows you how life is without it, if that makes sense. You go for like when I was 13 and a lot of other juniors as well playing all your national competitions and stuff like that. When you're 13, you go to school, you come in and you train and then go to sleep and have dinner in between every night, five nights a week and then your competitions at the weekend. So you don't get much time for yourself and sometimes it's good when you're winning and you're improving and you're getting the results, but when you're not getting the results and 
when you're not improving, then you kind of ask yourself quite a lot, like, why am I doing this if I'm putting all, I know this effort and all this time, all my friends are out at the weekends enjoying themselves and I'm playing a tournament which is, requires five hour drive away, you start thinking to yourself, right, why am I doing this? And mm. a lot of people don't see life outside of that, if that makes sense, Ben, like, I think, like, I know a couple of football players when they're injured and stuff like that and they come back and they say, aye, I just, like, you just you just miss the training. Like, you, you miss this, the structure, you miss the buzz of ma- playing matches and stuff like that. And I think a lot of people don't know what life is without that buzz. And that was good for me to have that two years out. But I think as well, with juniors, you're always, like, for, for example, if I was number five junior, Right, or number four junior in Scotland. I was always getting to the quarterfinals and semi-finals of events, and then you're out the juniors, and you're at senior level, which means you might be only getting to the last 32, last 16 of events, and then because of that, you're not getting to the last stages. You're not getting good results. A lot of people think, right, this is too hard. This is harder than what I was expected. I was number four junior. Why am I not beating all of these senior players? And then because of that, they get themselves down, and then not train as hard, and then maybe eventually not playing as structured in the series as what they were as a junior. Yeah, I think that's actually tough for everyone. Whether you've been winning events in your age group and then you go to seniors and all of a sudden you're not winning, or even if you're just kind of the the kind of player that's able to turn up to a junior tournament, yep. kind of win some matches and then get knocked out, then you actually turn up to like a Grand Prix or something, which is kind of all you've got as a senior. Yeah, And you realise that like you're not really good enough to beat anyone at a Grand Prix. Like there's just kind of the bottom level at the kind of the Grand Prix events is really really high. Yes, yeah, so I know, I know, and I think that's it's a tough starting point if you don't start young. I like that your Grand Prix are your most like, prestigious competitions within the UK, so they are obviously going to be a high standard. But if you are 18 or 19, there isn't many big competitions that you can play and if you're not at a good standard then it's going to be hard for the first couple of years but mm. it's, I think as a whole the UK has to try and address that problem because there is quite a big dropout between 18 and 21 and I, I, I don't know if that's because for example I played in Belgium for two, uh, two and a half seasons when I was 20 I played National 2 and National 1 which is like your You've got your Super League in Belgium and then you've got National 1, National 2 and National 3. So I was playing at your second and third top two divisions. But a lot of the players who were similar standard to me, they don't work because they're getting enough money from table tennis. Really? Which means, wow. I don't mean a lot of money, but I mean enough money to... Enough to live on. Enough to live on, enough to maybe, right, okay, I don't need a 16 hours a week job which is going to give me £100 in my pocket per week. I'm just going to keep playing table tennis. Which means if the UK did have a similar setup to that, which I had in Belgium, you you maybe get more juniors training harder and playing as they move out juniors into seniors because they've got a bit of money in their pocket. That was actually one of the questions I was, I was going to ask you, is that it seems that in all the other European countries there's the the top level of player is the same, but there's so much more strength and depth. There's so many players in France and Germany that would be like ranked twenty in in England or in the UK. And I was going to ask, you know, why you think that is. But you reckon it's that because they're able to play in more of a professional league and get paid some money, it actually is it's the incentive to to keep going, to keep training, instead of thinking, oh, I'm not I'm I'm not good enough to get right to the top, so I'm just going to stop. Yeah. Yeah, I think like if if you're not at the very, very top in England and Scotland, it's very hard to play table tennis, I feel, unless obviously you've got your local leagues where anyone from any standard can play. But as far as series table tennis goes down to like the sort for example, the top two hundred and fifty to top two hundred in England, you need to give reasons why the number two hundred in England should play. Can he afford to go to a Grand Prix? which is very expensive in travel and accommodation and entry fees, will the number 200 in England or number 250 in England want to do that if he's just going to go to a Grand Prix and win a couple of matches and 
and maybe not get to the last stages of some of the events. Like, I, I just feel there's not enough reasons to play. For example, in Belgium, you've got your club, which is maybe only 10 or 15 minutes away from you. There's home and away matches every week. So every Saturday, you go to your club and then the club, you'll be able to play your matches and have a couple of drinks after it and go for a meal with the players. It's just, it's more of an event abroad instead of, like, I always laugh like in Scottish tournaments and UK tournaments sometimes, like, when the final goes on in the late Sunday afternoon, there's nobody there. Yeah. Because everybody's wanting to go away home, which is totally fair enough. They've been there all weekend. But it needs to be more structured. It needs to be more... Right, okay, we're not just going to turn up and play our matches, but there's going to be an event, it's going to be, uh, we're going to get a couple of drinks, we're going to have a buffet. I feel in Europe, even at beginner's level, there's still a home and away structure where players are turning up every week, they're playing their Saturday, they're going out for a few drinks after it, and they're having fun instead of turning up, playing their matches and going home. More of like a social community yep. feel to the whole thing. Yep. And the other thing that you hosted recently was the the ETTU Cup, which is well. Tell us about that because I think uh, you know I didn't I'd never really heard of it before you mentioned it to me. So what what's the deal with that? Yeah, so because North Ayrshire, myself, my brother, and Colin McLeish, we have won the Scottish National League top division for four years running. So we could have applied after the first year, but we just felt the club wasn't ready to do so. Which ETTU Cup as the cup where any team finishing uh, in the top half of the division can apply for. For example, I think the top three teams in the British Premier League can apply for a U- ETTU Cup spot. And the top okay. and the top one team from Scottish National League can apply, obviously because the Scottish League isn't as strong. So we won the, the Division 1 of the Scottish National League. So we applied to... ETTU Cup and obviously it costs a lot of money and I think that's why for example we were the only British team this year to enter it and obviously the top three teams who finished in the British Premier chose not to enter because it does cost a lot of money we had we were very lucky because the local council were very supportive and they did say to us that if you do secure a home tie then we'll fully we'll fully fund that which was a great result for us. What happens is, in our group, which was Group B, there was five teams in our group. So one of those teams will host all the other teams. So we applied for a home tie and we got one, which was amazing considering this is our first time in the ETU Cup. So we had teams from Turkey, Romania, Spain and Belgium all come to our home club, which is North Asia to play round one, Group B, of the ETTU Cup, which, where I live, it's Solco, it's in the west coast of Scotland, it's a small town, uh, and we do very well to compete against the major clubs in Scotland, considering all the major clubs are from the big cities, like Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and so on, so for us to have all these top European players in Solco, it was kind of, it was a great moment for me personally, and for the club, because some of the players there had played World Championships, the Romanians, but Kazaku, who was the number one Romanian uh, part of the team who came to Solcoats, he played Musitani last year in Japan in the World Championships in front of 8,000 people. So it, it, it was just a, a good moment to have these players, the calibre of players, to our home venue. So we advertised it in local schools, we done exhibitions, we, we gave out 1,000 free tickets to local kids and just to try and create an event of it so on the Saturday night at the 7pm match where we played Turkey and the Spanish team played the Belgian team we had over 250 spectators crammed into a hall which was just amazing like, wow yeah that, that's that's really impressive to yeah, have that many I know like, I, I, I don't remember obviously I'm biased here because I'm not very sure but I don't remember <laughs> I don't remember playing in an atmosphere like that I've I've never uh, anywhere in the UK, I've never in British Premier League, anywhere I've never seen so many people crammed into a hall. You wouldn't normally get more than twenty or yeah, so. Exactly, exactly. Like yeah, the matches in the morning and afternoon, we'd maybe had fifty to a hundred there each match, which 
it was great. But then at the seven o'clock match, it was just a totally different level. But that's what I was saying about creating an event. But like North Ayrshire Council put on a posh buffet with like sandwiches and and prosecco, champagne. All our club members and everyone who came along was be able to go to that, which was just like in the table tennis world that just does not happen. Like mm. it, it was just great to not just have the table tennis, but have a social aspect of it as well. Where I think this has to happen more often in the UK. Definitely. To get people along. For example, me and my friends always go to the Six Nations, the rugby, when it's at Murrayfield, to watch Scotland play rugby. We don't just go for the rugby. We go for the event, we go for the day, we go for the train up and we have lunch out and we go for dinner. Like People don't just want to go and see a sport anymore. They, ha- they want to go and see a sport plus something else. And that's something yeah. that has to be some sort of social gathering, some sort of drinks or dinner or lunch. I think that's where we need to push on in the UK with table tennis as well. Mm. So how did you guys get on? It sounds like it's pretty high level stuff. Yeah, like we were bottom seeds, so there was five teams and we were the, we were, we were the bottom seeds in our group, but like we, we held our own, we totally held our own. Like We lost 3-1 to Belgium, the Colin Douglas picking up a win against the Belgium number three. We lost 3-1 to Romania with Richie. Uh, picking up a win against their number three. We lost 3-0 to Turkey, but I lost just in the fifth. Richie lost just in the fifth, and we lost 3-0 to Spain, but every match was we were competing against these guys, and it, it just shows you, like, these guys are very good, like, five of them were in the top 250 in the world, but it's up to 11 points. Anything can happen. It's if their level drops a little bit and you play a little bit above theirs and then I get a couple of nets set up the edge and then put more pressure on them, you're 6-3 up, 7-3 up and then anything can happen from there. So we just took that kind of attitude into our matches and went for it and I paid off on occasion. But it was good, I think. Like, to have an event in Soul Coach like that was amazing and to inspire all the players at the club and be able to show the juniors like this and this is top level table tennis here. That was one of the good things that came out of the event. Yeah, definitely. I assume I assume most of the guys that you were playing are all professional players, are they? They're yeah. they're in clubs in Europe. Yeah, well, I, I knew a lot of them because some of them played British Prem before or a couple of tournaments we've played abroad, so they knew us and we knew them. But I, they are full time players with just training six hours a day, uh, five days a week, so. We knew it was going to be tough from the word go, but I, as you say, anything can happen up to eleven points. Mm. Like, how do you manage to to get the training in yourself? How much are you able to to do a week? Because I know you're doing plenty of coaching. Like, you're not you're not able to do six hours training a day. So, how do you kind of balance the two? Yeah, I think like the two weeks before a competition, I always try to I always make sure I prioritise playing. Uh, I'm not saying I don't do any coaching. I always do coaching every week. So I might just play, like, for example, the two weeks leading up to a competition, I would just try and play every day. So like Monday to Friday, and then take a rest of the weekend, and then Monday to Friday. So just to make sure that I'm prepared for the competition. I always feel, though, with coaching, like a lot of people disagree with me on this, that a lot of people say coaching has an opposite effect on your game. Saying that because you're playing younger players, you're used to a slow ball, so when I do try and compete at my level, the ball's coming faster, which means that I'm not used to it, but I, I disagree with that. I think that I'm always in a table tennis hall. I've always got a bat and ball in my hand, which means when I do come and play, I'm not rusty. I'm not, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem foreign to me. I think for example, mm. some of the players who don't coach and only play, if they do not play, it means they've not held a table tennis bat for two weeks which means that when they do start playing again, it takes a couple of sessions to get used to it. So I'm always in a table tennis hall, I'm always talking table tennis, I've always got a bat and ball in my hand, which means when I do go and train, OK, I'm maybe not up to scratch and up to speed, I'm the usual standard I'm at, but it will take me less time to get to that level than someone who wasn't holding a table tennis bat or not playing at all. Yeah, definitely. And I think one thing I always struggled with in juniors was just like getting used to the pressures of playing big high level matches and I think with the coaching that I've 
that I've done over the past couple of years. I've been to the Spanish Youth Open, I've been to European Youth, I've been to Senior Six Nations, Junior Six Nations, and coached in these environments, which means when I go and play in a similar environment, a similar high-pressure match, I'm used to it and I know I've had the feelings before as a coach, so now I can go and as a player a bit more confident. I think that's I think that's what co- coaching's helped me, and just coaching as well. Like you learn a lot about table tennis as well. Like you, you learn. Like I've, I'm doing my level three. I'm currently doing my level three course just now. I'm nearly finished. But you learn a lot just about playing and the psychology of playing from that as well. So I definitely think coaching has helped me a lot in the level I'm playing at, just to understand the game and understand the ins and outs of how to improve and how to better yourself. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Like, cause you're just constantly thinking about it, aren't you? You're thinking about ways to ways to improve, and then even if you're coaching lower level players, the lessons that you're teaching them often they're still applying to your own game and stuff. Definitely. Like, uh, yeah. If I'm doing what I do, like a lot of one one to ones to week, and some of the one to one sessions that I do are with like top junior Scottish players, which are a very good standard. So it means I'm just blocking for three or four hours a day which mm. increases my feeling, increases my awareness and makes me a better player, so yeah. Now, I normally find when I talk to coaches and go and meet coaches that they all have kind of their own specialty or their own parts of the game that they really think are important or that they like to emphasise. What What would you say are, are those things for you? What are the things that you really like to make sure that all your players can do this thing well? Yeah, I... A lot of the players from North Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, they're all they're all very disciplined in the way they play, and they're all very, they've all got a very good technique. I always feel that when someone does begin to play table tennis, that they have a good technique. For example, a good forehand block, a good forehand spin, a good backhand block, and a good backhand spin. I feel if you advance a player too quickly, then these techniques might get you into trouble two or three years down the line. So I think I always try and tell the, the juniors or tell the beginners, if they're seniors or juniors, to make sure that they've got a good forehand spin and backhand spin and forehand block and backhand block before they move on to, for example, start worrying about reverse, reverse serves or side spin serves. And you definitely need to make sure you've got a good solid understanding of the basic strokes first before you move on. Like you, I know I'm jumping from a beginner's to standard here. If you look at all the top European players who have challenged the Chinese, right? Like for example, you've got Marcos Vitas, Timo Ball and uh, Ovcharov, Samsonov. Right? These four European players, they've got the best technique out of all European players. The basic technique as far as starting point, finishing point and the technique is so simple and so sturdy that very little can go wrong. And I feel mm. that is the difference between someone who's a European player who the technique's maybe not that good, but when they're under pressure, their technique goes meaning they miss. The Marcos Vita, Samsonov, Ball, Ovtarov, these guys' techniques, so simple and so spot on. When they are under pressure and they're playing Ma Long, Wan Hao, any of these players, their technique stays the same, which means they can challenge these top players. So I, I, I've got the kind of same view on beginners making sure that that technique's good and then you can move on to other things after that and what what kind of player do someone that's listening who realizes that you know they're quite good in matches but maybe they they know that their basic forehand backhand topspin technique isn't spot on is it is it just doing loads of forehand or forehand or are there other things that they can do to really work to improve it yeah like definitely at a time on table like you want to try and get a, a decent knocking partner and even in the, even the robots where you can get robots are very good for beginners where they can just stand there that ball does not move and they can just practice their forehand and backhand strokes but yeah I would just definitely try and get those as consistent as possible making sure that you know what you're doing and even if you're looking at videos on YouTube you're like YouTube's been great for me and I keep telling the juniors and seniors at the club if you're, if you're not too sure about something Google it, YouTube it because everything's online these days you can figure out anything from YouTube mm. so get on there and get studying to see what you 
need to achieve to get to that different uh, next level. Yeah, definitely. Like that's something that I mean, when me and you were were growing up, we definitely never had that ability to. You, know, you can get access to the top players, the top coaches, all kind of breaking down the technique step by step. Like we never had anything like that. Exactly. I know. I think as far as table tennis goes, we need to use that more often because it's free. It's easy to upload. It's. I just sat. I know a lot of the good players as well. Just sit on YouTube and just watch matches and study players. And like, okay, what did he do with his backhand there? Why did he have that backhand down the line? How did he, how did he manage to take forehand count all of that forehand down the line? Like, mm. yeah, it's just it's, it's a great thing to have. Which, as you say, when we were 14, 15, we never had that option. We never had that luxury to do that. Now, one thing I like to end my interviews on is with a top tip. So, and just ask the guest if there's if there's one big thing that they would like to share with all the listeners that they think is really going to help them improve their level and continue developing. Have you got something that you'd like to share, Chris? Uh, yeah, like when I was growing up, one of the coaches who came down and coached myself, my brother, ten years ago, and he was saying that try and just be a sponge. Right, and I, I, I said to the coach, I'm like, what do you mean? Try and be a sponge. He said, just try and be a sponge. Try and soak everything up. Try and soak every bit of information that any coach tells you. And I think that that stuck with me and I've and I passed that down to the players at the club that I coach as well. You do get a lot of information from coaches and as maybe one coach might say something and the other coach might say something totally different. But it's up to you to decide what bit of information you want to take in and what bit of information you want to try and work on because it's at the end of the day it's your decision to base your game around what you think will benefit you in winning matches so I think yeah be a sponge and try and soak up all the information that is given to you and don't forget anything when when I went away to Denmark I I didn't do this so much when I was younger I just I think when you're a kid you don't really think about it so much but I just I had an app on my phone for writing notes I was just Literally after every session, I might spend 15 minutes like trying to write down everything that I've been told because it's so easy to forget like yep. all the different things if you don't put it down straight away. But yeah, there's just so much you can learn from things that coaches say and players. And I think normally our retention rates are just pretty poor unless you like make a conscious effort to remember it all. Definitely. I totally agree. I think like, if you do go to a training camp or a training day or you do get told a lot of information which you're never going to remember. So it's about picking out what information is more more important to you and sticking and remembering that and then going along to work on that and your training. Yeah. Right, well, it's been great talking to you, Chris. Um, I'd like to finish off just by finding out kind of what, what your future plans are for, for the club and for yourself. What's coming up this season that's exciting you? Yeah, so we have, we've got the British League, so British League's great. I love it. It's my, one of my favourite weekends, well, it's four weekends of the year. Uh, so we're, we're looking forward to that. And as North Ayrshire goes, we've got a good bit of funding from Sports Scotland for a direct direct club investment to increase our membership. So one of our main aims from the club is just to get into schools, get kids playing table tennis and get them along to the club as much as possible so yeah growing membership increasing the standard of our players increasing the number of teams we've got and as I say our club's based in a school which is a, a new school it's only been open for three or four years so we're hoping to and we're in meetings and talks to turn the school into a school of sport which would be a table tennis school of sport which means there would be coaches to have on table tennis as part of curricular time and we would be getting the top players out of the school and doing one-to-ones and stuff like that so that is a promising prospect for our club as well yeah that'd be that'd be pretty cool that would be good uh, as a player you just keep training and seeing what happens I'm pretty relaxed that way I'm just I don't try and beat people I don't try and aim and say like okay I want to beat him this year I want to beat him I just if I keep training and my level keeps improving then the results will follow yeah definitely Cool. Well, it's been great talking to you, Chris. If people want to, um, if people want to follow what you're up to and and check out the club, have you got social media accounts and websites you can share with us? Yeah. So just North Ayrshire TT uh, on Twitter at North Ayrshire TT on Twitter and Instagram 
and their website is northeshrttc.co.uk. So we've got a lot of good stuff on that website and on our Twitter and Facebook as well. Great, I'll put all that in the in the show notes on the blog. Spot on. Cool. Thanks, Chris. It's been good yeah. talking to you. Cheers. I wish you good luck in the um in the British League in a couple of weeks' time. Hopefully you can you can make it into the playoffs. Definitely. And same to you. Keep up the good luck. Cheers. Cheers. All right. See you later, Chris. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye bye. 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 Well, a huge thanks goes out to Chris for joining me on the show. We spoke about so many different topics there. It's hard to pick out particular things. I feel like Chris is quite a similar person to me in the way that he well, he loves talking about talent, development, how you get good at table tennis, why some people get good. Like This is the kind of thing that I love talking about. And I could have spoke to, to Chris for absolutely hours about all of his thoughts on, on talent and how it all comes together to create a player but we I tried to trim that down and keep that relatively short now one thing that I would like to really draw out was Chris's philosophy as a coach that he would prefer to have a two-star player with a five-star work rate I think that's what he said as opposed to a five-star player with a two-star work rate and this is quite interesting because it's it's the whole short-term versus long-term thinking. And I'm very much agreeing with Chris here that, that we should always be thinking long-term and looking for the kind of players that are going to be really keen putting in the work. And even if they're, they're not the top players right now, if they've got that five-star work rate and they're prepared to stick with it for five, ten years, they're the ones that in the end are going to become really good. And I've spoken to people on the show before, like Rory Scott, who who was happy to say that he didn't think he had particularly any talent for table tennis, but he's been playing for 20 years or however long, and now he's up there as, you know, just outside the top 100 in the UK. And that that is the whole thing of if you can get someone with a five-star work rate, and if you can develop that in yourself, then that's really the key to long-term success. It doesn't matter if you're the one that picks it up really quickly or if you just happen to be better than other people at table tennis when you first start. It's about growing and building that five-star work rate to ensure that long-term success and development. So I really hope you enjoyed that episode. Something slightly different just to cover so many different topics. But if you're into table tennis, I hope that you found that useful. As always, please head over to iTunes, leave the show a review if you can. We've got a fair few number of reviews on there now, so that's nice. Um, Subscribe to the show on there, use Facebook, Twitter, tell your friends, and I will be back next Friday, and I've got Jesper Ratzer on the show. If you don't know who Jesper is, he is the world champion at Racketlon. It's a really, really great interview. I recorded it kind of a few days ago, and it will be Coming out in a week's time, that's definitely one not to miss. Jesper had to pick up table tennis basically from scratch at the age of 28. And in order to compete at the highest level of racquetlon, he needed to get pretty good at table tennis pretty fast. So he joined a club and he's really committed to it. And kind of five years later, he's now a pretty top table tennis player in Denmark, um, having never really played before he was 28 years old. So Really great story from Jesper. He's got loads of great tips to share as well, having learned to play as an adult. So that's not that's an episode that you definitely want to check out. I'll see you in a week's time. Have a good week. Uh, this has been the Expert Table Tennis Podcast with me, Ben Larkham. <laughs>